I want you, if you have your Bibles or have your cell phones or have your iPads or your Palm Pilots, if you're from that generation, <laughs> to look simply at a text in Matthew, the, uh-uh, Exodus, the second chapter. <laughs> in the 10th verse, where it says, and the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. I want to preach something this morning entitled, Can We Be Friends? Can we be friends? Several Sundays ago, uh, Nicholas Kristof in the New York uh, Times op-ed entitled, When Whites Just Don't Get It, said that many white Americans are fed up with the coverage of the Ferguson shooting of Michael Brown. He said, uh, a plurality of whites said that the issue of race is getting more coverage than it deserves. Christoph then recounts a 211 uh, study uh, done at Harvard that found that whites on average believe that anti-white racism was a bigger problem than anti-black racism. He uh, comments that this is white delusion and gives several reasons why race and race relations deserve far more attention, not less. He suggests that the net worth of the average black household in the United States is $6,314 compared with $110,500 for the average white household according to 2011 uh, census data. The gap has worsened in the last decade, and the United States now has a wider wealth gap by race than South Africa did during apartheid. Whites in America own, on average, almost 18 times as much as blacks. In South Africa in 1970, the ratio was 15 times. The black-white income gap is roughly 40% greater today than it was in 1967. A black boy born today in the United States has a life expectancy five years shorter than that of a white boy. Black students are significantly less to attend schools offering advanced math and science courses than white students. They are three times as likely to be suspended and expelled, setting them up for educational failure. Because of the catastrophic experiment in mass incarceration, black men in their 20s without a high school diploma are more likely to be incarcerated than they are to be employed. This according to a study from the National Bureau of Economic Research. Nearly 70% of middle-aged black men who have never graduated from high school have been imprisoned. When I finished reading this article, as an African-American male, I realized that I had been drawn from the water. The metaphor being drawn from the water is found in our text in Exodus 2. A man of the house of Levi marries a woman of Levi, and they have a son. She saw that he was a special child, and because of the threat of death from the Egyptian edict that every Hebrew boy that was born was to be drowned in the Nile, she hid him for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she made an ark of bull rushes. She waterproofed the boat and then put the child in it and set it afloat in the reeds at the edge of the Nile. The baby boy's older sister stood from afar off to see what would happen to the child. 
The daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. When she saw the ark amongst the reeds, she sent her maids to get it. When she opened it, the child cried. She had compassion on the child and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his older sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, let me go and find a Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you. And the child's mother was found and was paid to nurse her very own child. The child grew up and was brought unto Pharaoh's daughter and became her son. And she called his name Moses because I drew him out of the water. Being drawn out of the water is a metaphor of salvation. It is to be delivered from state-sanctioned death into a life of privilege and resources and ultimately a call to draw others from the water. After reading Christoph's article, uh, that is how I felt as an African-American male who had risen to the level of a professor that I had been drawn from the waters. I had beaten the odds. I had escaped the death sentence that is so often given to African-American males in this culture. Someone here certainly will ask, what is the cultural death sentence that you are talking about? Thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> permit me to explain. <laughs> One of the major points of the Christoph article was that friends open our eyes. And when we are friends with people who are different, it opens our eyes to their truth and their reality. Christoph says some straight people have gradually changed their attitude toward gays after realizing that their friends or that their children were gay. Researchers have found that male judges are more sympathetic to women's rights when they have daughters. I believe that we are more sympathetic to illegal immigrants when we meet them and talk with them and hear their stories and feel their pain. I think blacks are more understanding of whites when they have true white friends. Yet, because of the de facto segregation of America, whites are unlikely to have many black friends. A study from the Public Religion Institute suggests that in a network of 100 friends, a white person on average has one black friend. Can we be friends? Can we be friends? Can I speak openly and honestly about the reality that I see? I must tell you that I have totally abandoned the argument of trying to convince individual people or this society writ, writ large that America is racist or the existence of white supremacy. Most whites, not all, important to say that, most whites, not all, simply refuse to be convinced. Most are simply not interested in the plight of black people, Hispanics, immigrants from south of the border or other people of color unless it causes them pain in their lives. Now, I still believe in and I still use the term white supremacy, but rather than try to convince people, I simply clarify in people's hearing what I mean. Following Thomas Kane, when I use the word white supremacy, I do not mean to suggest that the entire nation is wearing Klan gear or painting graffiti swastikas. Instead, I tend uh, to connote a de facto white supremacy where the privilege of whiteness is assumed and perpetuated across generations so that taking the historically long view, the majority of property, wealth, and material goods are owned and operated for white profit. This inequality is embedded in our society by generations of average Americans choosing the comfort of apathy over genuine challenge of equality. 
worried more about my 401k than material, political, rhetorical, and representational equality. Our crime is racial indifference and the institutionalization of privilege for one group. Can we be friends? Michelle Alexander, in her classic work, The New Era of Jim Crow, defines racial indifference as a lack of compassion and caring about race and racial groups. And I add, often those that are not our own. It is the myth of post-racial America. Racial indifference is different than racial hostility, where the assumption is that systems are necessarily predicated on the desire to harm other racial groups. Now, I'm not in denial about the fact that there are other forms of racial hostility that do seek to harm other groups, but most racial indifference is masked in a system of practices that perpetuate the lifestyle and habits of European immigrants' descendants over others in this nation, no harm intended. Many whites deny white privilege and refuse to accept this reality when confronted with it. Can we be friends? With that said, if I'm not already in enough trouble, uh, <laughs> the events, <laughs> mighty quiet in this place. <laughs> well, with that said, the events at Ferguson represent the, f represent the frustration regarding the issue of violence against the black community Starting long before this, but I will start with the law and order mantra to the war on drugs, to mass incarceration, to stop and frisk what we in our community call driving while black, to racial profiling, to shoot every bullet out of your gun and ask questions later. The result being the militarization of police in attitude and equipment state terrorism against the black community in general and young African-American males in particular. All the while, racial indifference propagates the myth of the pure and uh, simulated suburban society that has become our national image. It also perpetuates the ghetto as a living nightmare, a place of violence and warfare, a jungle, some believe. And so militarization is justified as the police are doing the best they can in the jungle. This delusion is perpetrated in the media that portrays as random the apparently senseless acts of violence that only supposedly wear a black mask. 10 out of 10,000 people can be looting and in the media it is portrayed as all hell is breaking loose. The whole community is looting and rioting when in fact a few people Racially insensitive institutions profile many black male youth as thieves and criminals. I was raised in this. I was raised in this. I was raised in a black neighborhood, went through much of this, all of this. I, I was raised in this. And I'm thankful to be able to live to say that I beat the odds. I beat the odds. And we wonder why people in Ferguson are angry as they see a son shot and left for four hours in the open air. I was angry, I was angry, but I've been drawn from the water. Can we be friends? I've been drawn. I was angry, I am angry. I, I, I was angry, I am angry, but can we be friends? I was drawn from the water. Now I'm also very clear that I'm not the only one here who has beat odds. There are some here, probably a woman here, and maybe a 
man here who has suffered from sexual abuse and assault, domestic violence, date rape, molestation, child abuse, and you're sitting here today in your right mind, healthy and able to move forward in your life, and you can join me and say that you too beat the odds. Or there might be a same-sex person here who has known discrimination, bigotry, intolerance, and violence based upon sexual preference and the choice of a partner, and by all rights and privileges, you should be bitter and filled with hate, but you have been drawn from the water. Or maybe you're Hispanic and you live with the suspicion and consistently reminded that even though you were born here, you don't belong here. Maybe it was bankruptcy, illness, the challenge of a special needs child, painful divorce, isolation based upon what one did or said. I'm not the only one who beat the odds. Can we be friends? Can we all that beat the odds, can we be friends? Can we, so many of us, who have been drawn from whatever cesspool that sought to drown you, can we be friends? Can those of us who have beat the odds realize that we beat the odds because we have friends? I believe that this text <laughs> it's rough up here. Woo. <laughs> I wonder if those of us who beat the odds realize that we beat the odds because we have friends. I believe that this text shows God's ability to provide friends for our deliverance. In this text, God provides friends, including family, so that Moses could beat the odds. I want to highlight Moses' friends, including family, by three direct quotes in this text. The first is in verse 6. This is one of the Hebrew children. This comment is made by Pharaoh's daughter. When she saw the child, she recognized that the child was different. The child was not one of her group or one of her race. We all see difference. Some people say that they're colorblind or something of that. What I believe, uh, what they mean is that we see color and we don't associate a negative value to that which we see. I see difference, and it's a challenge not to associate a negative value to the difference that I see. She said, this is one of the Hebrew children. And then it says, she had compassion on him. She had friendship on him. She had mercy on him. She had love on him. She had respect on him. Ultimately, she had so much so that she even adopted him as her own son. How did she get this kind of compassion that even though she was an Egyptian for a Hebrew child, I want to suggest she probably had Hebrew friends. <laughs> she probably had Hebrew friends. Then in verse 7, shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee? This was said by the sister in the palace. Notice that, the sister in the palace, the sister in the palace, the sister. I say this to blacks and minorities, don't give up on being friends and being close. A whole lot of things can happen when you're close. Dialogue can happen when you're close. Understanding can happen when you're close. Friendships can happen when you're close. The oldest sister was close enough to Pharaoh's daughter to suggest a solution. And Pharaoh's daughter must have had some kind of relationship to trust that she would find the right woman. Even if you are in the minority, whatever that may look like, don't give up on the relationship. 
how did the baby's older sister get that close to Pharaoh's daughter? She probably had some Egyptian friends. <laughs> you ain't listening. <laughs> she probably had some Egyptian friends. And finally, she called his name. Uh-uh, she adopted him, took her, and made him as one of hers and called his name Moses because he had been drawn. The whole plan comes together. And God shows us that God is our friend. God put the plan together to pull Moses from the water. God is our friend in Pharaoh's daughter, touching her heart, giving her compassion. It is God at work in our lives to bring us from these cesspools that would demean us and defame us and harm us and hurt us. God has compassion on us. God loves us and God adopts us as children and God gives us strength and God gives us refuge and God gives us hope and God gives us a prophetic voice and God allows us to beat the odds and God stands us up on our feet and God brings us to seminary and God. If you are sitting here in your right mind despite all you've been through, God pulled you out. If you have been able to go on despite disappointment and heartache, it's God who's pulled you out. If you beat the odds, it's God. God turned things that were not tilted in your favor. God pulled you out. Every time somebody calls me professor, I hear, drawn from the water by God. Every time I hear Frank A. Thomas, PhD, I hear God pull me from the water. Every time I hear Nettie Sweeney and Hugh T.H. Miller, professor of homiletics, pulled from the water by God. Every time I hear Reverend Doctor, we don't even have to get that deep. Every time I hear myself or I label myself as Christian, drawn from the water. It took me a while to figure this out because I thought that I had delivered myself. I thought my sparts got me out. My intelligence pull me out. <laughs> My connections, I happened to be at the right place at the right time. But one day when I finally figured out it was God all the time had pulled me out from the water. You know what I said? Take me to the water and let me be baptized. I went to the water. And when I came up out of the water, I heard a voice say, go and make friends of all nations. And baptize them, I mean, pull them out of the water and put them back in. Draw them out of the water and you can put them back in. You can pull black folks out of the water, but I want your ministry to be bigger than that. Don't forget about Hispanic folks, white folks, gay folks, and other straight folks. Make friends of all nations and pull them out and then baptize them. Can we be friends? Can we be friends? 
Can we all be friends? Can we all make space for whatever story we have that allowed us all to beat the odds? Will you stand and be friends with others who may not, uh, uh, you you may live in a neighborhood uh, where the tanks will never roll in your streets. You may be from a community, there's nowhere in the world they would militarize, but you go and stand with those in the militarized zone because you have friends and you want to be a friend. And you heard him say, make friends of all nations. In the African-American church, I've learned that after the word of God has been spoken, there is only one response. We call it yes. Yes. Yes to you will. God, I know that there's more that you require of me in this area to make more friends. And my soul says yes. We're going to sing that. And I'm going to ask you, I believe that somewhere in this message, God spoke to you. Maybe God identified somebody that you might need to make friends with. Maybe there's some stand that you might need to take for someone who's a friend. I want you to hear And my soul says, yes.